Hey everybody, welcome back. I hope you're doing super well today. Today's video is just an interview between me and Brandon Morin, and I went on his podcast. He interviewed me about the current market and other things that I have going on. I found it to be super interesting. I had a lot of feedback from people that are following his channel, so I thought, let me just go ahead and post it here for you guys as well. So I hope you enjoy it. Let me know your thoughts and feedback in the comments. So Ricky Carruth, good morning to you. Appreciate you jumping on the podcast this morning. Uh, good morning, bro. How you doing? Life is great. Thank you so much. And so I want to talk about some of the things you and I have been sharing on social media a lot, and that is the housing market in 2023. I think you and I share a lot of the same views as far as the data that a lot of these media outlets are manipulating to lead people to believe that there's this huge, massive crash that agents got to be worried about and all this this doom and gloom. What is your outlook? And I think I know, but like, it's crazy, all, all, all this kind of fear porn. What are your, what's your outlook on the housing market in 2023? Well, it's, it's super disappointing that uh, media is driven by clicks. Um, you know, it's just really disappointing. Um, you know, and the headlines, a lot of the headlines, you'll read the article and it's the exact opposite of what the the headline says. It's like homeowners are going to have an ugly 2023. And then within the article, it talks about how incredibly solid the market is and how, um, you know, that this is nothing like 2008. So that's what's very interesting is when you compare the headlines to the actually body of the articles. They can't really, a lot of them can't, well, none of them can back up. Every single article talks about how this isn't 2008. Um, you know, so I, I don't know, man, about media and stuff. It's super disappointing to see that it's driven by clicks versus just trying to help people. Um, but to answer your question, I don't really care what the market does. Um, you know, it, it, I mean, I care because if we have like a wave of foreclosures and it gets really bad and unemployment shoots to the moon, then that's not good for a lot of people. And that hurts the, uh, you know, the working man, which that's where I came from. Um, and so it doesn't hurt me uh, as bad because I've been through this. I know how to take advantage. So personally, it doesn't matter to me. See, it's, it's mother nature. I can't stop it from happening. So, um, you know, it's hard for me to worry about you know, what, what's going to happen. These predictions that we hear from Fannie Mae and, and NAR and mortgage bankers and um, realtor.com and, you know, all the different, you know, outlets that predict and everything. It's funny because they're all kind of predicting it for it to be kind of flat down a little bit transaction wise. All these predictions don't mean shit because if you look at their predictions over the years, they've always been wrong. Number one, and number two, um, with them kind of playing in the middle, it seems like they're just trying to say, well, if it crashes really bad, at least we weren't saying it was going to surge. And if, if we said if it surges, at least we didn't say it was going to crash. That's kind of how I feel like everybody's kind of playing the game right now in the middle, um, you know, to play it safe. That way people can't go back and say, well, you know, you said it was going to surge and it crashed or vice versa. Um, it's just when you look at it from a bird's eye view, you know, it's really uh, something else. And, you know, even if you're a brand new agent, um, you know, in this game, you know, new, newly in this game or, you know, experience, still trying to build your business and stuff like that. I just want people to know first and foremost, before I say what I think is going to happen, that it absolutely just does not matter. Your job is to go out there and just build your database. Um, and the bigger you build it, the, you know, the busier you're going to be. If you're talking to the most people, you're going to yield the most transactions from your efforts. So, what does all this matter at the end of the day? Sure, your business may fluctuate a little bit with the market, you know, year to year, you know, season to season, market to market, but it's always, every year is different. You know, 19 was different, 20 was different, 21 was different, 22 has been different, 23 is going to be different, 24. It's always different every single year. So what does it matter? Um, we're going to have some down years, some really good years, some a lot of average years. None of this means your business is going to go to zero and you have to get out of the business. You know, my goal would be and what would make me super happy is that if every single agent stayed in the business, um, you know, that that would be the ultimate, you know, place for me to, to, to smile really big is that nobody quits. Everybody stays in there, keeps hustling, keeps trying to build their database. It's unlimited for every single person forever. You know, you could work 365, seven days a week the rest of your life. 
and never even scratch the surface um, for what's available for each and every single agent. But I mean, what I think, I think that next year, um, I think prices are, are going to soften just a tad bit more over the next three to six months. It's going to kind of flatten out and then it's going to start curving flat to up. You know, um, I think it's going to be like a really flat U shape, you know, and where we're going to end up. I, I, I'm actually, you know, not to sound hypocritical, but I kind of feel like we will be kind of flat price wise. I think we'll kind of start out. It'll it'll kind of come down and then it'll come back up and be somewhere close to where we started the year at. I think 2024 is going to be a little bit of appreciation. Listen, again, who cares at the end of the day, um, you know, for buyers, you know, like the article came out that said that 250,000 homeowners that bought in 2022 are underwater on their mortgage right now. Um, you know, we all said that was going to happen. You know, we all said, okay, um, buyers that buy now, sure, prices could soften a little bit, but it doesn't matter to you because you're not buying it to sell it this year or even next year. You're buying it to keep it for three to five years. The 250,000 property owners that bought this year that are underwater, they all put three to 5% down, VA loans, FHA. Um, they're, they're sitting on even better rates than just the, 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 you know, the regular market. You know, they're probably sitting on like three uh, and a half, you know, to four and a half percent interest right now. They they bought that property to stay there for a while. And honestly, um, you know, over the next, you know, year to two years, they're going to start. They're going to have some positive appreciation. You know, they keep that property three to five years. They're going to have nice appreciation. You can't build equity paying rent. And um, for buyers. We know properties are going to be worth more three to five years from now. For sellers, we're still up 40% from pre-pandemic home prices. Um, you know, although uh, even though we're down a little bit, we're still up substantially from pre-pandemic. Um, you know, for investors, rents are through the roof right this second. And they're, you know, there was an article that, that I think Redfin put out that said that they felt like rent was going to, I think it was Redfin, don't quote me, but I think they said rent was going to come down a tad. Um, but I think Realtor.com said rent was going to be up like 3% or something like that next year. So rent is really high. That's great for investors. Um, that's one thing that's going to keep prices up, I believe, is the rents being really high along with um, no inventory. You know, builders are going to have a really down year next year. Um, you know, they lag so much. Um, you know, they're already down like 20, 30 percent, something like that, something crazy in just a matter of six months. Um, so inventory is not going to come from builders as far as like a surge of inventory. Foreclosures aren't going to happen by the truckloads and the traditional seller isn't going to sell that's sitting on really cheap rates. Um, but I think it was Redfin again, I'm, I'm Redfin or Realtor.com that said inventory was going to be up 22 percent next year. That would be great. And it's kind of like when the moratorium was, um, when, when we had the moratorium for foreclosures and we basically had, let's just say zero foreclosures during that time. And then as soon as they open up, then we kind of have this rush of foreclosures, which is only like <laughs> minuscule, minuscule compared to like pre-pandemic levels, but it's still like up 300% from last year. Um, it was kind of like, oh, it's up 300% from nothing. That's kind of how inventory is going to be. The 22% is uh, still going to be historically low, but it's going to be up from this year, which was really, really low. So, um, and if inventory did hit the market, bro, it would get scooped up so freaking quick, yeah. so freaking quick, just because the institutional buyers that are out there buying, on top of just demand from the regular, you know, you know, everyday buyers and sellers, um, demand, dude, for me. It's like demand is building so much right now. Like I feel like there's this underlying historical pinned up demand. Like I feel like we're 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 experiencing like some pinned up demand that we've never really witnessed. And it's all gonna come down to interest rates. You know, I, I think next year I hope that we get into the mid fives. Um, you know, I, I, I I'm just saying I hope. I don't know what, what will happen. But if we can get into the mid fives, like earlier this year when it was mid fives um, and prices were higher than they are right this second, um, that was like a heavenly market. 
you know, like buyers are still like, we were still getting multiple offers, not as many as we were, but we were still getting multiple offers. Things were things that we weren't getting multiples offers on. We were still selling within a week or so for a really high price. Um, buyers were happy. Sellers were happy. That was like a dream market, you know, five and a half percent. We stayed there for like two months or so, something like that. I think when we get down to that level again on interest rates, I feel like that's going to be a just an because well, I think when we get there next time, we're going to be at lower prices than we were last time we were at five and a half. And so if you combine lower, if you combine, if you look at how great that market was and then think about if we can get there again, interest rate wise at lower prices than where we were last time. I think we're just kind of lining up for just I think 2023 is just going to be one amazing year for the people that have a very super positive perspective um, on the market and kind of see it for what it is an amazing opportunity. Yeah. Listen, there's a ton to unpack there. And so I'm going to try to, you, you made some really, really good points. I'm going to try to work through this in this conversation and starting with mortgage interest rates, right? That's the kind of the, the past life that I come from. And I 100% believe we are going to see rates at five and a half percent, probably sooner rather than later, because as the Fed continues to raise the, the, the fund rate to fight inflation and inflation comes down, we know mortgage interest rates follow inflation. We know that. And so all the mortgage people are getting excited because all the people that are buying are going to refinance here in the first quarter yeah. of next year. Why? Because what happens with as, as the Fed continues to damage the economy on purpose because we're trying to slow down the economy. We're trying to we're trying to uh, raise unemployment. All this is to fight inflation. The worse the economy, this is what people in our industry, Ricky, don't understand. The worse the economy gets as we get closer into a recession, mortgage rates go down. They go down. People don't understand. That's why refi booms come from is they come from recessions. And so rates will absolutely be probably first quarter be five and a half, maybe even lower. We've had some great pricing days just in the last couple of weeks. I mean, we're, we're pricing 30 year loans at our mortgage company at five, nine, you know, five and three quarters, 15 yeah. years, you know, so, so I think that's going to be the case. The other thing that you said that I love the point that you make is the business is on a spectrum. It doesn't go from where we were at last year to zero. And the best thing that that I think you said was, well, what I wrote down, let's put things into context because you're right. People are taking these uh, these headlines and they're manipulating the data. And when we look at transaction count coming out of 2021, call it six, six and a half million sides. Let's, let's compare that to the worst real estate market you and I or anybody's ever seen in 2008. There were still four and a half million transactions. And to your point, who cares what happens, I think is the absolute best mindset to happen. If next year we land at 5 million transactions, it's 10 million commission checks. It's a phenomenal opportunity. And so, yeah, go ahead. What do you want to add to that? Well, I think that, uh, I think the, I think one problem with agents and even investors and everybody, they're just so short term minded. Um, you know, you, you should be thinking about what you can do to plant the seeds over the next 12 months to really have a massive 2027, 2028, stuff like that. Um, you know, thinking about, oh, you know, I mean, yeah, let's go out and close as many deals as we can next year, but you know how quick this year is going to come and go next year is going to come and go. It's going to be so fast and whatever you accomplish is like great, whatever. But here we are in 2024 now. Now what? You know, the work you put in last year is what's going to reap the rewards for 2024. I'm thinking about like three years ahead. I don't really care what I do this year. But um, yeah, like in 2008, from what I understand, you said four and a half million. Um, from what I understand, it was four million, um, you know, just probably getting data from different sources or whatever. But 2012, um, I believe was around four and a half to 4.6 million uh, transactions. And um, that's what NAR, I believe is, uh, or, or, or really all the predictors except for Fannie Mae. Yeah. You know, Fannie Mae is calling for 3.9 million. 
for existing home sales, which would be worse than 2008. But um, that's pretty far fetched. But these 4.6 um, predictions, I think, could be right in line with you know what's going to happen uh, next year. But when I look, when I think about my 2012, when it was about 4.6 million, that was like an amazing year. That mm -hmm. was one kick ass, incredible year in 2012. Let me tell you, I was there. I was selling. That's when I was building my business. And that was that year was like, you know, oh, like it yeah. was incredible. And 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 like to think that we're going to have, you know, like if these predictions come true and we have four point six million transactions next year, I'm just thinking, wow, you know, what an amazing year it's going to be for the people that, again, look at this for what it is and go out there and take what's theirs. Yeah, well, and that's really uh, a good segue right into my next point is, yeah, I got in the industry in 2005. And so like you, during those times, here's what I've been telling new agents, Ricky, this is why I'm so much looking forward to the next couple of years. This is my own experience and my own opinion. I want to get yours. I love selling real estate in a normal market much more than I like selling real estate in this crazy seller's market, this anomaly that we've been living over the last three years. I would much rather sell real estate in a market that we're heading towards. Why? Well, because number one, if to your point, if inventory goes up, well, we'll buyers have a better opportunity. It's a better experience for buyers. They don't have to get to these houses in 2.7 seconds. And oh, by the way, seller's mindset around the value in which a real estate agent provides increases. What do we know about these markets? As we shift up and down from seller's market to buyer's market to normal market, the, the more severe, and I know you know this, the, the more severe a seller's market, the more commissions get compressed, the more discount companies come out to fruition, the more I buyers, the more this, the more that. As markets shift, commissions go up. I buyers start to leave the business. These discount brokers start to close up shop. And so the value of the traditional real estate agent starts to resurface itself. For sell by owners can't sell on their own. All these benefits, tons of expired listings because of bad agents, so on and so forth. Do you like selling real estate in more of a neutral, normal market? Or, or do you prefer the seller's market that we're kind of coming out of? Yeah, and you're right. I think there was a study that was done and some data that came out that said that buyer, I think, forget which company, I want to say Redfin again, that buyers, oh no, they were predicting that the buyer agent commissions would rise next year, which I put a video out like a year or two or something like that ago when there was all this controversy about commissions coming down and average commission rates coming down. And this is when prices were escalating. And I said, sure, like, look, at, but we're making more per transaction, even though we're getting squeezed, you That's know, right. 0.01% or, you know, we're, we're getting, you know, 2.3 you know, instead of 2.5 or whatever, you know, market you're in, you're getting squeezed 10% of your commission. Well, but prices went up way more than 10%. So the amount of money we made was as agents was way more per transaction, even though our commissions got squeezed a little bit. And I talked about this, even though like as the market, you know, converts back to normal, right. Where, you know, you actually have to market the property a little bit. It takes, you know, we're, That's it's right. 60 days, it's 60 That's days right. to a contract instead of one day, you know, last year the seller was saying, well, who's going to, who's going to charge me the least amount of commission because it's only going to be on the market for one hour and we're going to get 15 offers. Percent. But now, um, you know, it's like we get one offer within 60 days and you need an agent that really understands how to negotiate and you want, you're going to pay for a better agent. You're willing to pay a little more for a better agent, let's just say in, in a different market, um, which would be great because if prices end up flat, um, you know, um, that means, and, and commission rates increase, look at where we are. And then if we see appreciation the next year and, and, and commission rates increase because people see the true value in having a professional negotiate the deal and handle the whole thing, um, then look at where you are. You've got higher prices and higher rates all of a sudden. That, in my mind, will happen. We'll just have to sit back and see. But to answer your question, um, honestly, I'm just going to go back to my original statement with I just really don't care 
I'm going to take whatever market is thrown in front of me and just absolutely annihilate it. Um, you know, um, it, I, I, I guess more of the question is if I had to take my pick, what would I want? I don't know, honestly, like taking a listing, getting 15 offers in a day is fun, you For know? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Um, I, you know, in that scenario, see, in that scenario, it's really hard for new agents because a new agent is normally trying to work buyers, and now they have to write 10 offers for each buyer to try to get something accepted, competing against 15 other buyers on every deal. It's hard to get a listing because, again, the seller is being real picky about what agent they pick, and the very experienced agents know how to talk to the seller and squeeze their commission you know, from 5 to 4.9 you know, to get the deal done. And um, they know they know the lingo better. So last year was really, in my mind, really hard for new agents. Right now, it's way easier for new agents, honestly. Um, um, but uh, I, I don't. I, I think it, like if I have my pick, maybe as an experienced agent, maybe I want the last market just because it's fun, exciting, quick. We're getting deals done, high prices, more than full price. Buyers happy, sellers happy. Um, but for new agents, people trying to build their business and everything, I think that market's a lot more challenging. And I think for an agent like that, who's still trying to build their book of business, I think a normal market is apps right now, like right yeah. this second, I think is just beautiful place for somebody to start their career as a real estate agent and kind of build that book of business. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, I, I just, I, I believe that we're getting back into a professional's market. I mean, my, my issue with the market we're coming out of, Ricky, is that you have real estate, you have every industry that is driven by the housing market, they're, we're coming out of all-time highs, right? You got every Tom, Dick, and Harry getting their mortgage license, getting their real estate license, becoming this, becoming that, because they're looking for the quick cash grab. So Personally, I don't love that market because the seller just hires little cousin Johnny who got his license over the weekend because you just stick a sign in the front yard and get 47 offers. He looks like a hero. I, I much prefer a professional's market where all the, you know, I guess that's my next point is. Again, like I, in my world, yeah. I, I, I hope this is what I hope for is that not a single agent quits the business. So let's talk about that. So tell me about that because as transactions go down to your point, you know, everybody's calling, call it, we can land somewhere around four and a half million. Um, let's say we land there, right? So as the market shifts, historically, we've seen memberships go down. I know your yeah. position on, on wanting every agent to succeed, but the reality is not everybody can play in the NFL. You know, sure. there are going to be, it's just not, not a reality, not a reality. Yeah, it's not and a so reality. The, I understand so, that. So my position, and, and this will be some maybe some good healthy debate, is I think the industry is due for a uh, a world where you get a lot of these people that maybe have done damage to the the real estate agent industry and get them out of the business, get them out of the way, because mm -hmm. the barrier to entry is so freaking low. The debate I would love to have either now or or, or some some other podcast is what it should take to get into the industry. Because I don't think it's fair to the consumer that little cousin Johnny has no experience in anything, no business experience, mm -hmm. no sales experience, no marketing experience, no negotiation experience, can, can hang out on the internet for 40 hours and then go list somebody's $450,000 house. I don't think that that is fair to the consumer. And I think that the barrier to entry to listing a property should be a lot higher than it is versus people's largest asset getting trusted by some dude that has no experience and just giving realtors such a bad name. I mean, you know the stats as well as I do. I mean, we're, we're well under used car salesmen and attorneys, all of that stuff. So I am under, with, with great confidence to say, we, 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 we need some of these people to get out of the industry. What, what is your position on that? Well, um, you know, I used to be Cousin Johnny. Um, you know, I think we all were at one point and we all had to take our first listing where we didn't really know what we were doing. So I take it back to, you know, when I started in the business and I think about, you know, um, what I went through and, you know, somebody has to give you that start. No, nobody that takes their listing, nobody that takes their first listing knows what they're doing. You know, when you took your first listing, you didn't really know what you were doing. 
when I took my first listing, I didn't know what I was doing. Even if you're trained to the hilt, you, you don't have any experience. And you don't really know firsthand how this is going to go. So everybody has to start somewhere. So, you know, what I've, what I've learned is that, and you're right, not everybody's going to be an NFL player. And so the people that aren't going to win, that are going to have to end up leaving the business, they're going to leave the business. There's, there's nothing you can do. There's, you, you could spend, you know, four hours a day with them, training them and teaching them everything. And they're still going to go out there and lose um, no matter how much time you spend with them and, and vice versa with this, the, the guys that are going to go win, you, you could spend no time with the guys that are going to go in and they're going to find a way to win. So the winners are going to go win and the losers are going to go lose. Um, and I mean, for me, I just think about when I was starting and, and like the, the low bearer of entry. I mean, if it wasn't for the low bearer of entry, then I would probably wouldn't be in the business myself. You know, that was why I got into real estate, because I could have been a doctor, a lawyer or a real estate agent. And I said, OK, 10 years to be a lawyer, 10 years to be a doctor, one class to be a real estate agent. I'm going to go with this. And this opportunity gives me the same income opportunity as the other two. However, I don't spend hundreds of thousands to and 10 years of my life to get there. I literally spend four hundred dollars in a semester of my life. So. I thank God for the low bear of entry because real estate, as you know, has just been a blessing to me and my life and my family's life. And it continues to be. Um, no, I, I think, I, I, you know, I see both sides of it. Let me just say that. But I kind of like it the way it is. And I think the people that are going to lose are going to come in and lose and weed themselves out. Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it could give us a bad name, but I don't think that making the bear of entry um, you know, any more is going to prevent that. I think you're still going to have, could you imagine that... if attorneys had a weekend class, how many people would be in prison that are innocent? Yeah. It'd yeah. be insane. I... It'd be fucking yeah, absolutely. insane. Do you know I, how many also... people would be in prison for tax violations if CPAs had a weekend class? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think the problem is with the debate is that, you know, when little Johnny's selling the house, um, you know, listen, when I got in the business, I didn't touch my sphere. Um, you know, now I look back why? on that. And regret why, why, tell me why. Well, I look back on that and regret that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. now knowing what I know now. Sure. But when I got in the business, um, I didn't touch my sphere. I went straight out. Well, there was two reasons. One, I knew that if I couldn't sell people who I didn't know then I wasn't going to make it anyway. So mm -hmm. I wanted to just go ahead and get straight to that to see, you know, I, I challenged myself, like, let's, let me go ahead and conquer this because if I can't, if I can't, if I can't create a business with people, I don't know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be able to create a massive business. Cause my thing was, I'm going to be number one. Yeah. We so agree on that. Think, we agree on that a thousand percent. And then, and then the, and then the, the, with the sphere, I thought, well, they know I'm new. So they're not going to use me. Um, I don't want to make things awkward because back then I didn't understand relationships over transactions. Right. I was, yep. I was, I was taught, you know, the old school, you know, get them closed kind of yep. stuff, you know? And so I didn't want to have those weird, awkward conversations, you know, with friends and family. Whereas, you know, now I got to see them at Thanksgiving and everybody's wondering if I'm going to try to sell them a house. Yep. I'm an introvert, honestly. So like when I'm out in public so and stuff, <laughs> I, I, I'm like, you know, I've never wore a badge. I've never, if somebody talks about real estate in public, I'm going to like run the other way. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, I don't want to be seen as, you know, the, the sales, the salesman, um, you know, I want to be seen as a hard worker trying to help people and stuff like that. Um, so I kind of separated my personal and my, my work life. I didn't really blend the two. I never really got into the sphere of influence thing, you know, but, uh, but yeah, like, you know, that seller hiring cousin Johnny, that could happen and it does happen, um, you know, but at the same time, you know, Uncle Ed knows that Cousin Johnny is brand new and doesn't know his ass from a hole in the ground. And chances are um, he's not going to hire him. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think a higher percentage of sellers won't won't hire their family members who know that they're brand new. Um, but I think I think where where you're going with it is. Um, is people that don't know cousin Johnny and that don't know that he's brand new and that he's coming into the game here. Um, kind of, they don't realize how new he really is and he ends up getting a listing and then 
maybe he screws it up. Maybe he doesn't, whatever the case may be. But listen, we, we all got to learn, you know, yeah. at some point, somehow, some way. And, so and let's Cousin talk about Johnny that. could be a yeah. future top producer. For sure. You know, that's, that's another thing. See, Cousin Johnny may be one of the guys that make the business look bad and we want him out of the business. But also Cousin Johnny could be a future top producer. You know, and I want to give Cousin Johnny the best opportunity that he can. See, I, the thing with me is I don't want to rule anybody out. You yeah. know, I want to give everybody the benefit of the doubt that that they're going to come in here. And even if they suck right now, you know, I still feel like, you know, maybe something will happen. There will be some kind of click where now they're on the path to becoming that top producer. You know, that that's that's what's in me about, like, yeah. wanting to keep everybody in the business is, is I feel like, some of these people are future top producers, you know? There's no uh, doubt. I don't know. Let, let, me, let me clarify a point. I have no issue with Cousin Johnny. It's more that my, my issue is with our industry, more, moreover, is that Cousin Johnny doesn't get the leadership and the support that he should get when he takes his first listing. And we put new agents in a position to commit malpractice. There, there's not a world, there's not a, there's not a, uh, there would never be a world where a doctor does his or her first brain surgery unsupervised, untrained, without pr all kinds of processes in place to ensure that the, 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 the patient survives. And yet we put little cousin Johnny in that position every day. So let me just rephrase my position on this is that the industry as a whole when we talk about the barrier to entry, I agree that everybody has to start somewhere. Under which circumstances is the thing that I wanna debate? Under which mentorship is the thing that I wanna debate? Just letting little cousin Johnny get the, get the license over the weekend and let him loose like most of these companies do, I think is the, is the disservice to the consumer. It isn't cousin Johnny per se, it's that the industry sets people up for failure. And I think that's the part that we've got to change as an industry to your point to help more of these people succeed and not be so quick to let these people put them in a position to do harm to the consumer in the first place. That's yeah. more what I'm what I'm debating. Yeah. Yeah. And that and that's a good point. You know, um, like there should be uh, you know, there should be there there's no hand holding. That's right. right. That you, you, you you will not find a brokerage that will literally hold your hand. Nobody. I mean, you might come across an agent here or there who might, you know, go to the listing appointment with you and do that. Maybe that is so rare. I don't care where you go. Um, and so it's a, it's a, uh, you know, it, it's a life or death thing. You're going to get in there and make it happen and figure it out or you're not, but you, I don't care where you go. I've never seen anywhere that will actually hold your hand like a brain surgeon would his, his protege right. and walk you through the entire process top to bottom. And that is a serious, um, you know, downfall, honestly. Uh, that's the one piece I think that's missing and you can't do that in a classroom. See, that's the problem. You That's can't, right. you know, you can't do, okay, let's do a higher barrier of entry with, you know, education. I don't care how many times you go through all this. And, and, and what's, and what's crazier is that, he, you know, well, at, at least in my state, every county has a different contract. Every brokerage has different paperwork you have to do. So it's not like you can do a blanket um, education process around how, you know, what, what, you know, what documents have to be signed and, and stuff like that, because like here in Alabama, you got the recad, you have to do a net sheet, you have to do the, the agreement, listing or purchase agreement. Then you have all the the brokerage disclosures or whatever brokerage you're with and whatever extra paperwork they want. Um, and so it, it's, it, yeah, if we could create um, a scenario where as new agents come in, we have a process where somebody's gonna actually hold their hand locally through. And the reason why that doesn't exist is because you know, I mean, it, it's possible to put together a company that does that, you know, and like if you made that your main focus. Um, but geez, there's so many moving parts when you try to do something like that. Yeah. So that's what I'm talking about, Ricky, is just 
when, when I talk about the bear to entry, fine, L let it stay the way that it is. It's good for multiple different reasons, but maybe they go through some certification where their first 10 listings, they have a mentor that is on the transaction. So cousin Johnny isn't scared to go to his sphere out of the gate, right? Because he's got a mentor like you, who's going to be there, you know, every step of the way. So, you know, I, I guess, you know what they do in South Africa and Australia, Tell you know, me. they have a year long, both of those countries, they have a year long process there you um, go. where you basically have to be under someone in South Africa. Um, what do they call it? But they, you basically have to run the books and, you know, run, run some deals and like get serious before you can actually go out and certify it as an agent. Same thing in, in Australia. They Makes have a sense. year long, they have a year long process. Once you get licensed, then yep. there's a year long process from there where you're basically, um, you know, learning the business before you can actually get that next license. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that, makes a lot of sense. And we could probably debate that till we're blue in the face, but I just think that the industry needs to change some, some things like that per se, that essentially aligns with, I think what your core philosophy is, which is to decrease the failure rate in the industry. Well, I think what we're talking about would, would do a lot for what we're, you know, do a lot more for the consumer and help more of these people getting in the business succeed. So let's kind of transition into, you know, what are you seeing or what what are you what is your viewpoint on on how agents can go about winning in whatever market we're getting into whether it's a normal market or neutral market buyer sellers what what advice are you giving to new agents specifically new agents that either come on your team or whatever that you're coaching um what's the process that you think that they need to focus on to, to win in 2023 well, I think the main thing is, is not to even focus on 2023. Um, you know, it's just another year. Um, yeah. I think the, the core um, philosophies and principles just never change. But I mean, for new agents, um, you know, I, I take them through the process of expectations, you know, realizing that this is as hard as you think this is going to be, it's going to be much, much harder than you think it's going to be. And yeah. I want to kind of prepare them for that so that when they hit that brick wall of frustration and disappointment, um, that they're ready for it. And they know that that is normal. Um, yeah, every single agent, I don't care who you are, you run into that same, well, you get your license, you're on a high and then you ride that high for a little bit. Then you start to realize there's more information than you can learn in a day. You become a little frustrated. And then after you don't produce a sale after a couple of months, you become disappointed. And so you're on a high, high, and then you hit a low, low. And I try to set that expectation that that's going to happen every single time. Um, and then the future top producers kind of take a look around and say, okay, this was harder than I thought it was going to be, but look at Ricky, look at Brandon, look at him, look at all these other agents that are doing it. So if they can do it, I know I can do it. So then they get back on the horse and say, okay, I got this. Now they're riding another high, but that second high is not as high as the first high. And then, then they had another low, <laughs> but the second low isn't as low as the first low. And so yeah. they get, you know, there's big emotional roller coaster in that first, you know, six to 12 to 18 months in the business before you really kind of get some solid footing and um, people just need to understand that w what I want them to do is I think it's super dangerous to put yourself in the position where okay I got six months worth of reserve to go out here and close the deal well now three months in you hadn't closed anything now when you're talking to prospects you sound super desperate because you know you got bills coming up and you got and so it affects your communication yeah. uh, with your prospects which in turn um, prevents you from doing the deals because the prospects hear that in your voice and they go pick another agent and you wonder why. Yeah. Well, you know, for me, it's like, get your bills taken care of and make sure that, that you can, like, you should be in a position where if you don't sell anything for two years, you're good. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, you could do this, you know, you're going to, you, you got in this business for 30 years, you know, you should have a plan for 30 years where, you know, if it takes you two years to get this, who cares? You still got 28 years to crush it. But outside of that, um, you know, the philosophies and the market, and it doesn't matter. And, you know, closings happen every day, forever and all this stuff. I get into all the philosophies and then we get into routine. Right. So, um, you know, it depends on if they're part time, if they're working this job part time, they have a full time job. If they're doing this full time, you know, what what hours throughout the week, what time blocks do they have available to really dedicate 100 percent? And believe it or not, some of them don't even have that. They're like, well, I don't know. It's like, what? 
you're going to do what you can when you can do it. That's not a recipe for success. Um, you know, you, you have to have time that you're dedicating 100% to building this business or you're not going to have a business. So really got to define when we're going to, when they are going to dedicate 100%, no distractions, no negotiations to dedicate to the business. And then we start to try to break down what they need to do to be most efficient, get to their first deal the quickest and stuff like that, which in the beginning, it's going to be, I, what I, a good rule of thumb for me is spend half your time prospecting and half your time on training, right? So you got post license, you got contract training, you probably have training with your brokerage, you got MLS training, you got different trainings as a new agent that you have to get through that are mandatory. So I do, I like the 50, 50 rule, especially if it's somebody that only has like five or 10 hours a week, you know, spend half that time calling and half that time trying to bust through all that, that extracurricular well, the, the mandatory and the extracurricular trainings um, and just kind of don't worry about like doing e marketing and emails and social media and all this stuff right then if you, unless you just want to play around with it. But spend half your time prospecting on the phone, half your time getting through those trainings. Once you've knocked all those trainings out, which should, might take you a week, two weeks, a month, two months, however long it takes, then you can transition that 50% of your time to marketing where now you've got a little breathing room because you're through your trainings. You're still making your calls, but now you're dabbling into social media, email, direct mail. And that, and that's a good, that's a good thing because you didn't overwhelm yourself with that day one. You're not trying to do trainings, prospecting and marketing. You know, you have to baby step your way into the business. You know, like I say, you're going to do this for 30 years. Just take it slow. You're, you're good. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know, man, it, it's, it's different for everybody as a new agent. I have to kind of dig into what they got going on, what their thoughts are, what their game plan is going into right. it. So I can kind of help them readjust if needed, you know? Yeah. I think the, the thing that I, um, that you said that I, that I just see it so similarly is that, you know, having, you know, every folk... time I take a sip of Fresca, I get a new listing. Is that right? Every time I take a sip, I get a new listing, dude. Look. Well, when that phone mm. rings, make sure you get this on, on live camera listing. Like I hear a listing happen somewhere in Ricky land. I love it. I love it. Well, the thing you just said, and, and I love that you said that, and I hope your phone rings in, in a past client calls and you listed a house. But, um, you know, you talked about, you know, going through the four levels of learning, conscious incompetence, coming out of that, that deception, coming into, you know, the conscious competence and all of that, which was great. But the thing I love that you just said is having agents focus on, on, Pros direct outbound prospecting before they start going to the social media and the branding thing. Cause that's what I see. I mean, they all are running away from the prospecting and they're running towards the branding thing because they see people like you and whoever else so heavy on it that they think that they don't have to prospect from day one to start generating the business. But I see it the same way you do it. We, we build the business first, the first priority through direct outbound prospecting that gets cash flow coming in. That starts to build the business. And as that's happening, you can worry about content, which is a long-term play, as I know you know, and you can start doing that, but prospecting has to come first. How's the, um, you agree with that or you see that differently? No, absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, listen, for me, the, the key to all closings is conversation. So no yeah. matter if you're getting social media leads, open yeah. houses, direct mail for sell by owners, expires, geo leads, networking, sphere of influence, referrals, whatever it is, all the avenues come back to the same, you know, point, which is a real life conversation. hundred percent. So I think agents need to really understand that even if you're building your business on social, the social needs to be used to um, cultivate real life conversations. You know, how quickly can you use social to get to a real life conversation with someone who might you know, do a deal with you now or later. That's right. Right. So, um, and that's the yeah, difficult I mean, part is, is turning the social content strategy. We're talking about a new realtor, right? Like the guy that, or the girl that needs a deal, like you're saying, trying to get to that first deal as fast as possible to turn social into a voice to voice or a face to face conversation mm -hmm. is, is a lot harder to do than just picking up the phone and having a voice to voice conversation and send an appointment, and go see, see the person. I mean, that's what you and I, I think see it very, I think we see it the same way, but the content comes over time where people start to reach out to you, start booking calls on your calendar, all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, look, I, 
for me, it's just like, I don't care who you're calling. Right. You know, I, I neither care less Same. who you're calling. As long as you're calling people in your market yep. and you're approaching it from this is who I am. This is what I do. And I'm here to help you now or later. You know, I'd love to work with you. You know, if you want to do something now, great. If you want to do something later, great. Whatever it is, you know, I'm here to help you and, and, and provide you great service. Let's stay in touch. Boom. Grab their information. My thing's a weekly email. Yep. Um, you know, I mean, that that is my bread and butter. Um, and so for me, everything revolves around that. You know, every conversation I have is designed to a figure out if I can connect with this person, if I can connect with them, what can I do to help them? Are they looking to do something now or later? And then kind of stay in touch with them. Yeah. Yeah. What are your future plans? What are you working on? That's exciting that you want to share with the audience, Ricky. How's the team going? Give us a, a behind the scenes into Ricky land, as you call it. Yeah. Um, I'm really focused on the brand, uh, right this second, just trying to build that and, and just learn how to get better at content. Um, you know, Instagram is blowing up right now. Like I'm getting 150 organic followers a day, right this second, um, posting five times a day and stuff. So I'm fixing to film like 20 or 20 or 30 reels right now after this. Um, but just trying to build a brand really, cause everything kind of revolves around that. Um, as far as projects go, I mean, dad's handling all the day-to-day -day sales with, with the sales so, team, your, your sales business and then your sales team. Is he handling all that? It's just him. It's just okay. him. It's just him. He's handling everything. He's showing, he's listing appointments. He's just, he's just an agent handling our business. Got we it. have the admin, we don't have the team. It's just him. And uh, so he's handling all that. I'm still doing marketing, weekly email, me and him talk about deals. I'll fill in for him if I need to, something like that. But, uh, but yeah, I'm working on, you know, all kinds of stuff, honestly. Yeah. Uh, I'm traveling a lot. Like I'm going to be at Ryan Pineda's event in Vegas, speaking in uh, Long Island, Orlando, all in January. Then I'm doing a workshop here in my hometown in Gulf Shores, doing a three-day tour in Texas in February, March. I got Chicago and Kentucky. And like I'm getting all kinds of speaking, you know, injuries and requests every yeah. day. So I'm trying to um, just continue to get out there and get in front of people and spread my message and everything else. One thing that I'm really excited about is uh, buying these big commercial deals. That's kind of what I'm getting into. That's my next big thing is going after the big multifamily. I mean, I'm looking for deals right now. I mean, I'm sifting through as many deals as I can looking for, you know, something interesting as we speak. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about that because I've kind of, I've learned the process on that end. And, I'm, you know, that's something that's, you know, can create some serious wealth. So that's great. Yeah. So, so are you not doing the team, you're building your team, like the, the real, you know, the, the sales team, did you get off that? Yeah. Um, so I just, I never could make it work. When I tried to do it at Remax, it didn't work. Um, people came in left. And then this time around, everybody had too big of egos. I had an ISA getting 15%. I had a manager getting 10%. Me and dad are splitting the rest. And so everybody felt like they had to, everybody had such a big hand in it um, that they felt like they wanted the deal to go the way they wanted to get to go. And um, too many egos in the room. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, it just, it's just drama. Right. And so my thing is a simplicity. I want to keep everything super simple, uh, easy, um, uh, low stress. And I feel like a team is just as much work as being an agent. Honestly, you know, I built yeah. the team. I tried to do the team to step out of production, which, you know, when I built it, I'm like, I'm out right now. I don't want to, I don't want to build it and then stay in there for a year to help you guys get it going. I want to put the pieces of the puzzle in place to step out now. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it doesn't work like that. If you want to build a team, you have to get in there and actually get your hands dirty for another two to three to four to yeah. five years to really get it to a place where you can step out of production. And luckily enough, I've got dad who was happy to step in there and just keep closing the deals for us, you know? Um, so yeah, no, I, I the team thing, um, you know, I'm not a big fan, honestly, um, of it really in, in any perspective, but that's me, you know, and, you know, I'm not built for it. Um, I don't mind going out there and making a hundred thousand calls, 
I don't mind going and showing the properties and doing all the listing appointments. You know, I did it for 20 years. Um, but a lot of people did make the team thing work, you know, like Mark Spain closed 8,000 transactions last year. They're expanded in like three or four or five states or something. It's a different you know, skill set. It's a completely it is. different skill set. Completely different skill set. You're not like in the sales game anymore. You're That's in right. the management Leadership. of people. Yeah. You're yeah. in the management of people, um, you know, game and the management of people game is a full-time job just yep. like sales is. And, um, you know, I just have bigger fish to fry. You know, um, yeah. you know, I mean, dude, I'm, I'm getting all kinds of inquiries from all kinds of different companies and publications and, you know, celebrities are following me. We're collaborating and different things like that. I look at the next, honestly, if, if you want to know kind of what I, over the next say 10 years, like a lot of people out there, they're like, man, I wish I could be in good with these big influencers like Grant and Gary, and Ed, and Eric, and Tony, um, you know, I wish I was in good, you know, I wish we were like best friends, or I wish I could really, you know, get on the inside with somebody like that. The thing is, is that is that generation of, in, of business influencers. Well, there's a whole new generation of business influencers coming up right now. And these guys are way ahead of their, of their, of their time. They're way ahead of where Gary, Grant, and all those guys were at the same age, let's just say, just because the advancements in technology and, com and communication. And the thing is, is if you wanted to be close to like Grant, Gary, Ed, Tony, all these guys, then the, the best way to do that would be what? Probably pay them a whole bunch of money and get in their no. masterminds or God knows why. I mean, you know, no, 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 no. No, the best way, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is to have been there from day one. Oh, sure. Where you were like best friends with them from day Got one. Got it. Yeah. Where you collaborated a lot from day one. You know, you see these influencers, they collab and stuff, and they've kind of been around and collabing for years and years and years. 100%. Kind e of grew even, up even, doing it together. Even, even, when they were, even when they weren't well known at all. Absolutely. Right? And so that's what I'm doing like right now with these future influencers, which I'm one of them, you're one sure. of them, these future like business influencers that will be bigger than the Grants and the Garys and the Ed, that will be bigger than these guys. I'm like best friends with a lot of these gentlemen, yeah. uh, ladies and gentlemen. And um, that's what's exciting to me is I can see the future where in a world where we're looking at these business influencers and have, we're like, wow, this person did it. This person did 10 X. This person did a hundred X. This is, this is like a hundred X. This isn't grant. This is a hundred X, not 10. And, um, and, and like the Lord knows what the future holds, you know what I'm yeah. saying? In, in a no, it's a really like good that. point. Yeah. Because you, you nailed it. All those, the big influencers that everybody knows about now, um, to be fair, I mean, we, we, we owe them a lot because they've, they've carved this path to, to guys like you and I to now, and we could do it bigger, better, and faster, uh, right. because of all of that. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. And, and I, and what you're doing is great. I mean, the, you're going to go spend some time with Pineda and I think he's, he's doing a lot of great work and, and other people too, I think it's smart. And, and I agree with you. I mean, there's just a whole new level of opportunity i mean for, you see the, ryan ryan yeah. interviewed liver king like yep, yep. this past week he interviewed you know grant he interviewed brad he interviewed you know patrick he interviewed uh alex you interviewed yep. alex um like it, it's it's crazy um the amount of influence some of these guys have and like you look at what's going to happen over the next you know however long i don't know i'm excited to go speak um you know, there and tap into the audience a little more. That's what's exciting. I want to get into the real estate investing audience. Honestly, yeah. I'm okay. I'm, I'm I really awesome. I really love that side of it. Yep. Um, and so I'm gonna be doing a lot more of that. It's cool, man. Listen, thank you. That was a great hour conversation, and this is what I've been wanting to do with you and others. To your point, is like what I'm interested in with with content is. And, and I know you you want to do the live thing, and I want to too. But I I am just so much more interested in long form content like this, like deep conversation. And we have a studio here in Michigan, and 
I want to have you up here and, and get you in the studio, but uh, thank you for spending an hour with me because this is all really I want to do moving forward when it comes to content is just have meaningful, deep conversations that the audience can get a lot out of, you know? No, you're doing a good job and um, I'm excited to see um, where it goes and I'm glad to be, you know, on this journey with you, bro. Yeah, same. I appreciate you very much. Thank you. I want to, I want Look. I-35 with the top down, quit to tell a hater they should get like me. Seem like everybody 